your experience uh, in wealth management, so you don't only have the US perspective, you have the global perspective. Um, do you have a feeling that uh, there are differences in the behavior of affluent and high net worth individuals uh, across different cultures, ecosystems? for a financial institution that served a very exclusive client base over the last, let's say, 500 years, um, that they actually could use technology to expand their value chain and also deliver it to um, um, affluent or um, and people that are on their way to become that. Um, do you see this as a trend in the U.S. currently? Yeah, so uh, people always ask me, what is the threshold? What is ultra-high net worth and what is high net worth? And there really is no... Uh, threshold or yeah. have hard and fixed numbers for that. Uh, once you have set up for competency for wealth management, something that's a little bit broader than just investment advice, can involve insurance or other aspects and more holistic financial planning, you're really set up to serve a whole wide range of clients. And knowing, right, and taking a look at who those clients are, uh, as we discussed in our previous session, uh, entrepreneurs or people who are going to be inheriting wealth, or how do you set up your practice or your firm to be able to onboard and reach those clients? So I really liked what Jacob was talking about in terms of how to use language and how to reach people, because yeah. that idea of messaging and content is really critical. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I think um, to I think that there are of course regional differences uh, for certain uh, countries and groups of, uh, and also differences between a, an ultra high net worth individual or family that does have different topics to deal with than an affluent. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it, it, it's gigantic opportunities for, for financial institutions to serve them. Um, the title of the session is also Bank or Insurer. Uh, you are, I think, more on the bank side, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't like insurance. I love insurance. And if you do watch out, I'm going to sell you some after the um, event here. Just kidding. Are you still licensed? Uh, I'm still licensed. I'm proud, proudly licensed, at least in Germany. Um, um, what, <laughs> what do you think um, is the outcome of that? Or is that even the correct question, bank or insurer, who will get to the You know, I'm not sure about the question. I mean, the truth is that financial services uh, should be offered really under one sort of umbrella. We talked about before, our holistic financial planning really involves uh, banking, which could involve credit, lending, could involve insurance, which involves the insurance industry. And certainly there is a threat right from the banks, which are Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google coming to uh, the financial services market. So I think that uh, what we'll see as we move forward is less of segments and more of firms that are offering more products and more integrated products. I hear a lot of discussion but, uh, on this question, will it be the bank who gets the headphones or will it be the insurer who all have also branches that are dealing with, or departments that are dealing with this uh, target group. Uh, and I think it's a totally old school view on 
the discussion why? Because the customer, even the high net worth customer, he does or she does not care if it's a bank that delivers a solution or if it's insurer that delivers a solution. He wants a goddamn solution for his problem. And uh, I think that we are so, so, what? I, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's totally okay. Uh, I think we can, we will not be bit out. Um, but what I want to say is um, that I think the customer does not care about uh, for who delivers the solution. And this is also an opportunity for banks and insurers, those who are innovative and those who think outside the box, um, uh, to really approach this, this group and, and use it also as a test uh, field to then roll out the technologies and principles also to uh, poor billionaires, let's say. Well, I think what clients do care about is the brand. Yeah. So, um, they, I don't think they care necessarily what the segment is, but I think what's happened is all of these silos are really the way the, organ the industry has been organized. And also, it really uh, speaks to what is the compensation on the part of the individual. The compensation and part of a wealth manager is generally a percentage of AUM, whereas insurers are paid uh, based on the policies that they're selling. So I think uh, once that gets sort of sorted out and uh, has more equity or has more standardization, we can see these things sort of coming together uh, in terms of compensation. And unfortunately, that's where we are now. Uh, in terms of brand, uh, I would think that um, you know, these brands sort of need to come together. Some of the old school brands in wealth management have some cachet, but do not have it with the younger investor. Unfortunately for you and for others, insurance sometimes uh, has a questionable brand uh, in terms of sales. So Sh shall I tell you a funny joke? Uh, yeah. Why are insurance employees so happy about the financial crisis of 2008? Why? We were not the unpopular people anymore. Right. So, never mind. No, Show by side. No, and uh, I think that the way is insurance sales are made, also by the way, in the affluent uh, um, uh, group, it, that needs to be reconsidered. I think the times in which you grab people from the street, give them a three day or three week uh, education, and uh, uh, let them go on customers and try to sell them something. I think in the days of the internet, where it's revealing these things and where there's a maximum transparency, this cannot be done anymore. But I think it's not uh, so much the case in the, uh, in the, in the affluent um, um, area. For retail and the wealth management, the very same thing exists. I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the previous session, you know, yeah. the average age of the wealth manager is somewhere in the late 50s, trying to recruit new advisors into the market. And the first job for many firms is really a sales job, which can be a turn off for a next gen. And so that's something we're struggling with as an industry is in terms of future work and how to get people into the industry. And the first job is really a sales job. It really does not prepare you for uh, really anything in the um, uh, feel. I mean, if you're just out of college, I, I don't think any um, young recruits are going to be able to really uh, manage big portfolios or even no. turn those over to others in their firm. Or who, uh, which athlete or an athlete individual is taking a 26 year old college grad for serious, or in general, uh, a wealth manager that doesn't play in the same league. That's in our experience, we see a lot of uh, unemployed individuals, families, and affluent. They don't disclose and reveal all their wealth. They said they have the appointment in the bank, maybe wealth management, maybe uh, private banking. They're talking about certain uh, topics, and then they're asking, oh, out of regulation, we need to go through your uh, assets, and then they say, oh, do, you, well, well, do you have also a little bit of cash? And he says, yeah, I have a little bit of something. Here's this account, that account. But he's not going to reveal this entire um, thing. And there are actually studies uh, in Asia that show when you reveal your total wealth, to your bank um, and you um, give them the opportunity to develop strategies that really work for you, then actually your return on invest of your total portfolio is larger than when you don't, when you don't disclose and don't reveal everything. And I think this is a big opportunity for digital to aggregate data uh, for the affluent um, and to uh, make them uh, actually um, 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 have increased their return on invest. I think that's a great point because I think what's happened in the past is most high net worth or ultra high net worth individuals uh, had assets with three or four different providers yeah. just to sort of play them off each other and largely that was due to uh, equities or investment advice 
And now that people are really looking beyond that more in holistic financial planning, uh, I think they're looking to consolidate their portfolios under one particular uh, advisor rather than having it spread across. And obviously the return can be better. Uh, and then I think that also is, plays into the idea of how firms and people are compensated. So whether yeah. you're paying your financial advisor as a percentage of AUM or you're paying them at a flat rate, or even as we've seen in the US, a subscription fee. So uh, all of these things will uh, play into how people uh, allocate their portfolios. The Spotify of wealth management, uh, that's interesting, the subscription fee. Yes. Um, I have a question about when it comes to products, because the question is um, uh, who will get the affluent, uh, uh, the, uh, in the US or Europe, bank or insurer. And my big question is do we actually have the products um, and is there actually one player that could be dominant in um, various markets? And or are the cultural differences too big? We earlier heard that investment culture is also different between the different countries. Um, do you see um, any player that is able to um, deliver, serve the different markets in a, in a modern way? So that's a great question. I mean, today's high net worth and ultra high net worth are really more mobile and global yeah. than ever before. And so uh, I think the challenge is really for the big global service providers to be able to not only have products and services that apply globally, but also to hyper-localize them yeah. based on where people are domiciled or where their businesses are. So I think that will be the big challenge. And then the challenge- Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Come from- um, The Callistone Distributed Market Infrastructure Demo will start at 1.30. Please gather around stand 24 to learn more about their new blockchain-enabled technology. That stands 24 at 1.30. Thanks very much. Well, speaking about blockchain, yeah. <laughs> uh, we will have, I think, a lot of competition from regional providers who will be hyper-localized, but will have to improve their digital so that they're able to access people all over the world. Yeah, one other thing I think we have the bank or insurers who will get them. I think the big question is do we have regional providers, do we have yeah. people from the crowd investing uh, platforms that are going to also be interesting for affluent uh, or high net worth individuals, or at least for the people that work for them. Yeah. So we do see also a shift in financial products. Um, and will we see the death of the life insurance is a big question I, I, I'm always asking because I always think... Um, the death of life insurance, I love that. No, not, I mean, get me wrong. So I think strongly believe that life insurance has a term... A death of life insurance. A term, a term insurance. life... A term life insurance, I think, is very important for a lot of people uh, to uh, mitigate risk, and especially in the non affluent space, but also the affluent space. If the provider goes away, the partner, the attorney uh, um, uh, agency, and then suddenly you know, one partner has a heavy loss of income, that's a big problem. But it's cheap, everybody should get one. But the big question is of uh, capital life insurance um, that, that are super. I, I, that's a study on 10,000 millionaires out there, and not a single one person got rich by using life insurance products. And why is it? Conditions are really high, costs are really high. If you put 100,000 in, uh, 90,000 are, um, are only in the 10 out of commission. And to get this to the low interest rates that are provided with these products, it's really horrible. And I think um, we will see this as a trend sooner or later, also as a transparency of the internet, the death of the capital life insurance. Not the term life, but capital life insurance. Uh, because it's an outdated product uh, to sell people that don't know what they're doing, actually. Yeah. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the market. Yeah. There will be a lot of, um, in terms of products and um, uh, products that are offered, whether it's like insurance, wealth well, management products, certainly ESG has yeah. changed the way people are thinking about investment products and what actually, how success is measured. So AUM and assets under management and even investment returns are one way of managing success, but I think that our now, new next genders are going to really redefine how success is measured. So, are there any questions from the audience? I think they're uh, looking for lunch. Competing with right? lunch? Yeah, blockchain. we're competing with lunch. That's very and but, but thank you very much that you guys were here competing thank with you. lunch. That's really, you need to be really passionate about the topic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. So, if you made it to here, it means you really like the video. It would mean the world to me if you could hit the subscribe button down here or sign up for a newsletter so we can give you all the hottest, newest trends we scout around the world for free 
even sooner. Oh, 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 o